Good morning. How are you doing today? Wow, this is, we have one week left. Are you all anxious to go home? The only issue is... All right, enjoy the time you're here. I guess last week will be the most challenging and it'll be most fun. Uh, reminder, uh, Monday, uh, we, we are going to take the official BWSI 2019 photo. So everyone, please wear your BWSI t-shirt. So we'll walk over to Walker right after the seminar Monday, take the photo, and then lunch. So I guess uh, we have to decide who's going to get lunch first. Maybe whoever arrives first, get the first lunch. But anyway, remember to uh, wear your BWSI t-shirts. So uh, it is great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Evelyn Wang. She's the department head of the MIT's Mechanical Engineering Department. But as a way of introduction, I'm going to call each class, and could you wave your hands? So race car. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, UAV, racing. Uh, Cogworks. So uh, Metalytics. <laughs> Build a CubeSat. Okay. Uh, embedded system security. Hacking a 3D printer. Okay, I'm going from my memory, so. Assistive technology. Remote sensing for disaster response. Yeah. Okay. So uh, our team from Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that. Did I forget? Did I forget someone? Oh, I. I was counting. Clearly, I I must not be from MIT since I cannot count. Uh, the UAB, UAS uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar Team. So maybe you'll go first for lunch today. <laughs> so with that, uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Evelyn Wang. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be here. It's also great to see the energy in the room. So uh, thanks, Bob, for uh, uh, really taking the leadership in this program. Um, he's been really the key figure to make this all happen for you all. So uh, uh, we're all very appreciative of that. Um, I'd like to uh, today share with you some of our work at the intersection of thinking about renewable energy and the needs for clean water. And in particular, the group uh, that I lead focuses on taking advantage of engineered materials in a way to help us try to advance these types of technologies. So certainly we all know that um, in the US, we consume a lot of energy and we rely on all sorts of different sources for this type of energy. This is a pie map showing you where we get most of our energy from. You can see that we have a high reliance on petroleum, natural gas, and coal. And certainly it's been very useful as we all use it in our daily lives, thinking about how we heat and cool, say for example, residential commercial buildings, how we light up the buildings, for example, and how we actually live comfortable in these buildings in general. Also think about how we transport ourselves from place to place and think about how we utilize internal combustion engines mainly for transportation still. And finally, a lot of industrial processes um, and everything that we use from that of what we're wearing to that of that of power generation still relies still traditionally on a lot of these traditional sources of energy. So this is no surprise that this is a time where there are challenges now that we are faced with, in particular, thinking about climate change and the impact it will have on all of us as we look forward in the next decade even. And so I think a lot of the opportunities lie, at least for our generations and you guys, is thinking about, well, how can we develop new technologies such that we can solve these problems 
and that we can facilitate opportunities for the generations to come. A lot of my group has focused on thinking about these advancements in nanostructure materials. For those that are unfamiliar with this area, it's been abundant in the last few decades now in thinking about how we can take advantage of, of engineered structures where we can tailor them at the length scales even smaller than a hair, right? And that ability to take advantage of these kinds of materials and the ability to manipulate in the way to enhance and create new functionalities. They can have, for example, all sorts of interesting new material properties. Right? For example, what I show you on the right here is an, uh, a structure that's in fact 3D printed. It's a three-dimensional structure that can have interesting mechanical, thermal, and optical properties all at once. And that's an example of the types of materials now that we can create because of our new capabilities at these small length scales. We can also manipulate light in new ways. We can think about how we affect how we um, wet materials. For example, example, thinking about raincoats and the coatings that we utilize, say Teflon to repel water. We can think about these materials for CO2 capture, for example, and capturing the, the, extra, the CO2 that's emitted from the greenhouse gases. Finally, there are certainly many opportunities in energy conversion and storage. So while there's abundance of these types of opportunities in research that a lot of us have pursued in the area, um, the perspective that I have is that this is where the innovations lie and think about how we can address developing technologies and um, being able to address developing technologies at the macro scales. So I'm not sure what happened here. Um, give me one second. Um, so my perspective here is that if we can advance these materials, you can really advance. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, the opportunities lie in now think about these large scale systems, such as that of solar power plants, that of photovoltaic cells, maybe that of water desalination, and taking advantage of the innovations at the small scale to now start to think about more efficient, lower cost solutions. So what I thought I'd talk about today are three examples of where this has been pertinent to my research. Um, I bring back this pie chart that I showed earlier, and um, I wanted to highlight in particular, you said there's a small sliver right now that is focused on this renewable technology. It's about 10% of all the total energy. Right? And in fact, when you look at the breakdown of how we're getting this kind of renewable, I want to highlight, in fact, you can see solar still has a very small penetration. It's only about 6% of that 10%. And so, so solar energy in particular is relatively underutilized. And it's by no surprise when we think about the total energy reserves for all the different resources we have, solar energy trumps everything else, right? In terms of how much energy we can produce per year compared to that, say, of traditionally coal, of, an, of our total reserve of coal. So I'd like to think about, a lot of my group is, how we develop more efficient and lower cost solutions such that we can, in fact, deploy more solar energy um, approaches such that we can help solve this problem of climate change. So the first example I'll give you is an area that you may or may not have heard of, um, where we're looking at solar thermal photovoltaics, or otherwise known as STPVs. And you may have heard the word photovoltaics, of course. And when we think about photovoltaics or solar cells, they've been relatively now more commonly used, where the idea here is that you take advantage of the partial spectrum of the sun, where the energies are above what you call the band gap of the photovoltaic cell. And those, uh, th that energy is, in fact, converted to electricity through generating electron hole pairs. It's a relatively scalable technology. It's solid state in nature. However, a big challenge of this technology, while the costs of photovoltaics have gone down, it's intermittent, right? Because the fact that storage right now still with electrical batteries is extremely expensive. 
In contrast to photovoltaics, you can think about the other types of power generation approaches for large scale systems. And that's traditionally known as solar thermal. So you may have seen, there are certainly many examples of this around the world now. What happens in this approach is that you have a concentrating system. In this case, this is a parabolic trough. You collect the solar energy in the form of heat. And the heat is then taken to drive a traditional steam cycle. In this case, you can, in fact, absorb all of the solar spectrum in the form of heat. So it harnesses the full spectrum. And it can be also utility scale. However, because there's a lot more moving parts, we're using a steam engine in this case, right? Its maintenance can be more challenging. The advantage, however, is that because now we have taken the solar energy in the form of heat, we can store it relatively cheaply. And so certainly, there are many opportunities there. And this is why we've been particularly interested in this. Now, certainly, um, there are advantages of these both approaches, as I just presented. And the ones we've liked to focus on is think about, well, how do we now harness a full spectrum of the sun? How do we make it scalable, potentially solid state, because less moving parts makes it potentially cheaper? And also allow for this continuous operation so we can utilize this energy at night. And this is where the concept of a solar thermal photovoltaic comes from. So what I show you here is a schematic of a photovoltaic. And the idea here is that instead of just having the photovoltaic, what you do is you insert in the middle between the sun and the PV cell a selective absorber emitter. The idea here is you absorb all the spectrum of the sun in the form of heat, and you tailor the emission, the, the, the emission, the thermal emission, from this selective absorber emitter such that it targets the band gap of the PV cell. And this way, you can theoretically achieve over 80% conversion efficiencies with these devices. So this has been the opportunity we've been pursuing. It's a little bit less traditional in nature. You may ask, well, why has not it been deployed? And certainly there are many challenges. But the idea is that how can we then take advantage of these nanostructured materials in a way to help us think about this concept and maybe get closer to this theoretical potential. So this is a schematic on the left and some images of what we have created here. So we've, in fact, experimentally now been pursuing understanding, characterizing these types of devices and taking advantage, again, of interesting materials, platforms to help us realize higher efficiencies. What I show here is, in fact, now, the solar, su the sunlight is coming in here, and as I mentioned, it has to be absorbed um, from in, in the form of heat. And so we have to, in fact, take a very good absorber. The, what we've decided to do is that we know that black paint is a very good absorber, but what we've used to get very high absorptivity, in fact, are carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes, you may have heard of, are these kind of, kind of um, cylindrical structures that you can, in fact, grow that are relatively scalable. And they have a carbon base, right? So they actually have very good absorb absorptivity. And because of that, we've decided to pattern it, in a way, as our selective absorber to capture as much of the solar energy in the form of heat. Now, on the back side, as I mentioned, you want to capture the energy in the form of heat, but then you want to emit it. Because we're doing thermal emission, this has to happen at about 1,000 degrees Celsius. So it's a very high temperature emission process, by which now, in fact, on the backside, we can tailor what's happening by utilizing kind of nanostructured materials to now guide the light in terms of the wavelengths that we'd like to pursue. And then finally, then, we have the photovoltaic cell. Right? I mentioned a key attribute of the photovoltaic is a band gap because that's what determines if you reach kind of the near the band gap that you can kind of convert these electrons, the electron, create these electron, generate electron hole pairs essentially to generate electricity. And so this is a setup that we've used to now think about how we could potentially now realize these kinds of devices. What I show on this video here, in fact, is you can see that in fact the device, the selective absorber emitter is glowing, right? because it's beyond the vapor point, and it's actually so hot that you can see it glowing, okay? So what we've been doing is, in fact, as I mentioned, looking at these kind of interesting structured materials to be able to maximize the performance of these systems. 
I already mentioned these carbon nanotubes. In fact, we're using multi-wall na carbon nanotubes. These are typically what they look like. This is a scanning electron microscope image of kind of this cross-section of this region here, which we have patterned onto this surface. I'd also mention on the back side, we have these what we call photonic crystals. Essentially what they do is, in fact, effectively kind of um, uh, um, can selectively tune the wavelengths by relying on interference of the light, right? Um, in, in, in fact, in relying on the constructive and destructive interference of the light, then you can get particular wavelengths that then are emitted. And so in this cross-section image here, this is a one-dimensional, what they call a photonic crystal. It's made of silicon and silicon dioxide layers, as you can see here, of different thicknesses. And because you're relying on these different thicknesses and designs to now have these interference patterns, that's what allows you to tailor the spectrum. The other aspect what we've done is that because it's not completely efficient in the process, we've inserted now in front of this photovoltaic cell a filter. And so when there are um, photons that are below the band gap, the energies are below the band gap, in fact, they can now get reflected back to the selective absorber emitter and then re essentially recycled such that they can be used for emission at the proper wavelengths again. So this has been the setup that we've been working on. And I just thought I'd show you one graph of where we are. So the idea is with this kind of design, in fact, what I'm showing you as a baseline is if we didn't have this selective absorber emitter structure. This is your photovoltaic cell. And in this particular device, the efficiencies are relatively low. In fact, this is a relatively low quality cell. It's not a silicon cell. It's a low band gap cell because basically the idea is that band gap dictates what temperature you need for the thermal emission. So we're dealing with low, relatively lower temperatures on the order of 1,000 degrees. If you want to use a silicon cell, which is, of course, much cheaper, and now they can create relatively high efficiency cells, you have to reach about 2,000 degrees Celsius. So this is just to give you a comparison of where we are. The gray, as I said, is a baseline. And you can see here that, in fact, these are two different set STPV devices. You, see, you can see here this is conversion efficiency as a function of our power output power density. And you can see that we've at the point now when we have this kind of STPV device, we can in fact exceed the performance of these photovoltaic cells. And what this suggests, in fact, this kind of spectral control via the nanostructure design facilitates us to achieve this type of approach. An important metric also is looking at heat generation. As you can imagine, if there's any inefficiency in the system, that gets converted into heat. So you can see here on the right figure, this is heat generated as a function, again, of the output power density. And you can see that in the typical PV cell, that as you expect, as you have higher output density, you have a higher amount of heat that's generated because it's more inefficient. Right? And so what we see here is that using these STPVs, using the selective absorber emitter, you can reduce the heat load also by about 2x. So when we reported this work a few years ago, this was the highest conversion efficiency that we've demonstrated to date using these STPVs. Certainly I said, well, the potential is at 80%, and we are working towards that because as I kind of alluded to, the heat kind of, um, the temperatures that we're dealing with are large. That means the, the kind of losses have to deal with the system are challenging. So one of the things is that while we deal with in a lab kind of a one centimeter squared or two by two centimeter squared type device, as you scale up, this can minimize some of these losses. So what we anticipate is that as we scale to about a 400 centimeter squared device, which is a more practical type device, our conversion efficiencies can reach about 10 to 15%, which makes them more competitive with PVs. And then thermal storage becomes much cheaper. So this is one example of the opportunities that we think present themselves in thinking about these kind of tailoring of the nanostructures for util thinking about solar thermal utilization. Now coming back to this plot, uh, this slide that I showed you earlier, um, I wanted to touch a little bit on transportation because certainly um, an aspect of this problem is how we can minimize greenhouse gas emissions by using electric vehicles instead of that of internal combustion engines. 
So this is a project that we've worked on also for about now five years or so. Um, this was funded by ARPA-E, which is a uh, pro, um, uh, government agency focused on trying to think about breakthrough solutions in the energy space. So what we've been working on is what we call a thermal battery. And the whole idea here is, again, the challenge with electric vehicles, the reason why they have not been readily deployed is because of driving range. And we know batteries are improving, electrical batteries are improving. However, when we look at actually what consumes a significant portion of the driving range, it's in fact HVAC, right? It's for human comfort in the vehicle when you're driving in a hot day. And in fact, based on the statistics, you can see this is a power consumed by the HVAC, depending on what the temperature is, and it can be up to about 30% of the power right, of the whole vehicle. So in fact, what this translates to, in fact, is a reduction of your driving range to up to about 40%. So it can be significant. And so in fact, what we've been thinking about is, well, how do we develop a more efficient HVAC? Potentially that does not drain the electrical battery power of your vehicle while it's driving, right? So essentially what we're trying to create now is a thermal battery. It's providing heating and cooling on demand that you can also charge um, with your um, charging station at home, say, when you're not driving, but not utilize electric battery power. So this is what we've been working on. Um, like I said, I, we coined it a thermal battery because of the idea it's storing heat rather than storing electricity. And the metrics that we've defined here is based, is based on how we can, in fact, now make this competitive to that compared to what electrical batteries can do when interfaced with a typical vapor compression cycle for HVAC systems. The way we decided to approach this problem, again, is taking advantage of interesting nanostructured materials. In fact, the materials we're using are desiccants. So you may use them every day without even knowing them. For example, using a Brita filter. Right? A Brita filter, in fact, uses these zeolites, what they call zeolite particles, that help you filter out these various minerals that you don't want to drink. And so these kind of desiccants, or in fact, they're used in packages to keep things dry. Right? Silica gels are often used in this capacity. And the idea here is that we're taking advantage of these, what we call uh, these desiccants in a different way. And the idea here is that, in fact, say imagine you have a surface with these desiccants, um, and in fact, we want to now, ha we have water, say a bucket of water, and um, we now evaporate this water and it gets adsorbed onto these desiccant materials. In that process of adsorption, because it's on the surface, so it's called adsorption, um, what the process of water molecules now sticking to this high surface area material, you in fact release heat in this process. Okay. So that pro process of now kind of absorbing is exothermic in nature. You can imagine maybe where I'm going with this. And now if you think about um, in the process of the evaporation itself, like when we sweat, what are we doing? We're cooling, right? So in fact, if you have water that can now evaporate, then in fact you can get cooling. Right? And um, when you think about, well, sure, that's one way, right? That's one direction process by which you now capture all this water, say, on your desiccant material. Now, how do you release it? Well, the way you release it is you provide heat. You're essentially using thermal energy as a way to now release these water molecules from the surface of the material, and then eventually you can now condense it, okay? So that's kind of the operating principle that we've been working on using these all sorts of different types of kind of nanostructured desiccants to help us think about this thermal battery. So I highlight now exactly how this would work in an electric vehicle. So in the cooling mode, you have a reservoir, right? So you have this reservoir now that delivers, say, water um, through your evaporator to this adsorbent bed. This is where your desiccants lie. And the idea here is that, again, as you evaporate that water, you are cooling. We are providing cooling, and you can deliver that cooling to your electric vehicle cabin. Now in the heating mode, what you do is in fact now you take that now evaporated water and then you absorb it. And once you absorb it, as I mentioned, that's an exothermic process by which now you can generate heat. 
The thing is, it's interesting about this, when you think about changing phases, so from liquid to vapor phase, there's an important quantity known as a latent heat of vaporization. The reason why it's so powerful for water is because it's extremely high, right? And that's why, in fact, your computers, in fact, utilize liquid to vapor phase change for um, cooling your microprocessor. And so the idea here is that if we use water as the uh, adsorbate, right, this liquid that we want to change phase, in fact, you can get very high heating because, in fact, the latent heat of adsorption as you, in fact, interface these water molecules with the surface is about 1.4 times that of the latent heat of vaporization. And so that's why this is an interesting approach. And effectively, what we're doing here is we're creating thermal storage, but not in the traditional sense is that we're relying on a chemical potential difference between having a dry adsorption bed of your desiccants with a wet reservoir. And that chemical potential is what allows you to store this thermal energy. And once you open up the valve, you allow this evaporation process to happen or that adsorption process. Now, regeneration of this will be done by applying heat, right? So you can imagine now we have this thermal battery, we charge it up, like we charge an electrical battery at home. We can use take advantage of solar or waste heat sources very readily because it's relying on thermal energy rather, rather than electricity. So we've been working on this concept for some time, as I alluded to already, that the key here is thinking about how we can now get the kind of energy densities that we need in terms of thermal energy. And an important aspect of this is how we tailor these kinds of material structures, these desiccants. So silica gels are not great while they're very cheap. They don't really have the characteristics that we want. So we've been working a lot on these kind of zeolites and tailoring them, which are these very highly porous, high surface area structures, as well as what um, another uh, kind of class of materials known as or uh, metal organic frameworks or moths. And by incorporating these high capacity adsorbents, and also incorporating novel kind of binders that bring these kinds of what you almost look like powders into a matrix, you can in fact enhance the mechanical and thermal processes in a way to make this kind of thermal battery work. And finally, there's a very important aspect. It's not just about the materials. Engineering is a really critical part of this all, and that you have to design the system in a way such that you can ensure that the rates are sufficient to now deliver all of the kind of various um, uh, the adsorbates to the system and actually release the heat and deliver the heat when you need it in different places. So it's really the kind of the combination of advanced materials choices to be able to, um, as well as the heat and mass transport processes that dictate the design of the battery. While I won't go into too many details, I'll show you that we've had many generations of prototypes. This is our last generation developed in the lab in collaboration with Ford, in fact, who's interested in deploying these in their next generation electric vehicles. And the idea here is, in fact, that we have a two-bed design. The reason why we've created a two-bed rather than a single bed, which I kind of demonstrated with your schema the schematic, is that you can potentially charge on board, right? Because if you have waste heat from your, from your electric vehicle, you can, in fact, recharge it and now regenerate in this process. Um, I just wanted to thought I'd show you that, um, of course, experiments are never trivial. You want to characterize these kinds of systems. This is a kind of an image of what we have in a lab to now replicate what's happening in an electric vehicle. And we've thought a lot about the packaging and the weight and size constraints of these kinds of designs such that we can, in fact, effectively deploy them at some point in the future. And finally, I show a graph of a representative performance. So what I show you is the power as a function of the time. If you integrate this, you can get, in fact, how much, uh, what is this power dense, um, kind of the, the energy that you can extract um, from this heating and cooling. And um, when we kind of integrate, basically, under the curve, you can see that you can get about heating about four kilowatt hours um, thermal and cooling about 2.6 kilowatt hours thermal, which is exceeding the initial targets that we had to kind of aim for. And in the perspective, when we think about how this thermal energy kind of can be compared to that, say, of, say, lithium ion batteries integrated with HVAC, what I show you is this plot here, looking typically how you compare thermal uh, batteries in general and how we can put ourselves in the mapping of things. So here on the top, this um, left axis is specific energy. And the bottom axis is energy density. And what we've demonstrated so far is in this region here, in this blue. 
Um, we believe, and just to give you some sense here, the red is where lithium ion battery packs are based, based on this kind of cooling. You can see that we think that as we now develop further these technologies, we can really get to this top right regime, which is where we want to be so we can be really competitive with the market at, at this stage. What I've described to you is an example of electric vehicle type um, applications. However, um, we believe this kind of approach using these kind of novel desiccant materials and adsorption processes, in fact, can be now translated also to HVAC in your home, which is also a significant energy consumer. Um, and there are a lot of different applications you can imagine with the same types of physics. So for the last part of my talk, so I think I'm a little bit out of time, um, I'd like to think about, um, share with you our some work, and think about kind of, I mentioned, you know, there's a, a strong connection between energy challenges and water. Water scarcity is a significant challenge in a lot of our world. In fact, two-thirds of the global population is facing a water crisis. In the future, we anticipate water demands will be even more critical, even potentially more critical than that of energy itself. You can see that from this mapping the world that there are some developing regions that have significant shortage of water. The, the colors on this map show the number of months in which water scarcity is, over, is greater than, is essentially 100%. You can see there are a lot of places in the world that's dark red. And so um, certainly this is a big challenge for us. Um, an approach that we've been very interested in is thinking about, well, not only can we desalinate, which is also used in various regions, um, there's a lot of water in the air. Right? Um, in fact, the amount of water that, as a resource, is, is equivalent to about 14% of fresh water in lakes on Earth, or that's about 13,000 trillion liters of water. So there's a significant amount of water in the air. And so the question becomes, or what we were asking is, well, how do we harvest this water from the air? And maybe we can produce drinking water, especially in areas where you can't afford desalination units to make them efficient. They usually are very large in nature, such as our RO plant. And so this is the last topic that I'd like to share with you, where we're taking advantage, in fact, of the same materials I just talked about, these adsorbent, desiccant materials, in a different way to harvest water. Certainly, water harvesting is not a new idea. People have been working on it for some time. Um, a pretty traditional way to do this, in fact, is using refrigeration. So basically, you take your surface below the dew point, and you start to condense. The challenge with this is that this works very well in high humidity regimes. So you can see from this plot here, if your humidity levels are, say, above 50% or so, it can be relatively efficient. But if you're in desert-like regions where the humidity is, say, on the order of about 20 or 30 percent, the efficiencies of these types of systems are so low, it makes this type of dew harvesting process practically infeasible. So we've been interested in this particular regime, given the fact that if you look at that map again, most of these regimes, in fact, regions of the world, where um, there's a significant scarcity in the water, are also very arid in nature. Right. So what we have been doing, in fact, is thinking about utilizing these porous materials again and introducing a new water harvesting um, device that's based on adsorption. So the idea here is we've been focused on specifically metal organic frameworks. I mentioned these are also three-dimensional frameworks. The reason we've been interested particularly in these materials is because of the way you can tailor them to have the functionality that you want and get the kinds of behaviors you want to make this device work in these arid climates. And the way this device works is shown in the schematic to your left. The idea here is that you have these adsorbents in a thin layer. And at night, when it's cold outside, in fact, you capture the water from the air, and it absorbs naturally onto these materials. Now, during the day, you want to harvest the water. You utilize sunlight, again, as a means to do this, because you're using it, again, as a form of heat. It's a heat source to now extract or release the water from this material in this device that basically creates locally a very high humidity environment. 
And because of that process by which now you can generate enough vapor locally at high, in high humidity conditions now, that in fact you can condense at ambient rather than now relying on a refrigeration cycle. And so because of that, we've been interested in utilizing this kind of water harvesting from air approach using these interesting materials, like I said, these moths. And there are all sorts of moths out there. The one we focused on is moth 801, and this is the characteristics here. You can see here the water uptake as a function of your humidity conditions is that there's a nice kind of rise in the uptake around humidity conditions about 20%. And we're really relying on that point. You can tailor where that rise happens such that we can maximize the amount of water that we can capture using these materials such that this kind of concept can become feasible. This is an image of our device. This is a proof of concept device done at MIT initially. The idea here, again, here's your layer of your metal organic framework. This is a surface. Initially, we were trying to control the temperature of the surface so we knew exactly what that temperature was. But what was exciting about this demonstration, certainly from uh, utilizing sunlight to, to release the water from these materials, you see certainly over time, you see more and more accumulation of these water droplets. And this suggests that there certainly is promise in this approach. However, we know that, as you've experienced, Boston is a very humid climate. And what we want to demonstrate is that we can do this in these kinds of desert-like regions. And so we went to Tempe, Arizona. We were lucky to have really gracious colleagues that work at uh, um, University of Arizona that let us use our rooftops. You can see why this is challenging here. So this is looking at the climate. This is a temperature over time of day. Um, and you can see here that, in fact, that um, the dew point in this case, right, over night and daytime, in fact, is negative. What that means for traditional state-of-the-art doing type technology where you rely on refrigeration is the fact you have to freeze the water, right, to be able to actually now do this process. When you freeze water, as I just alluded to earlier, the latent heat is so high for water that it becomes so inefficient in this process. And so this is the opportunity for our type of device because we don't rely on getting below the dew point. You can see here that, again, here in the green is what the humidity looks like, right? And so because of that, you can see the humidities are low. This is a, the right axis here. So that this is a perfect test platform for what we'd like to pursue. So we've done some modifications because we wanted to further optimize for these particular conditions. I won't get into too much detail here, but one of the opportunities that we pursued, in fact, at nighttime, you can, in fact, radiate towards the, the, the sky. And because of radiation um, uh, of the process by radiative cooling, essentially, you can, in fact, help us further improve the, the device performance by how much we can actually capture at night. Okay, so we've done this um, on the rooftop. Like I said, this is just an image of what now this device looks like. Um, and in fact, this time, we do not use control temperature stage, and everything's just relying on ambient cooling. And so here's a video of what happens as you see that you're actually now desorbing the water from these materials. You see, it initially fogs up, right? And as the system heats up, you start to see that you can actually see what's happening on this uh, on the surface, right? So you can see certainly there's a lot of um, water droplets that are being formed. Certainly this is still proof of concept, uh, but we think this is an important demonstration to get us to the next step and think about scalability of this device and how we potentially now could think about a larger device for say a village in a remote area when power is not readily available. So I just showed you a few examples of where the role of nanostructured materials in different forms can have an important impact in the development of renewable energy technologies as well as water devices. I mentioned already, but I'll highlight again, I think, while there are certainly many opportunities in thinking about nanostructured materials, still we need to think further about where are the challenges and what are the things we need to address. The first often is scale up of the materials. The, the often the materials are still the bottleneck in the total cost of the system because some of these materials we finally tailor in a way that we have not been able to ne um, necessarily produce them at scale yet. 
And related to that, as I mentioned, is cost reduction. That's really critical in this process for practical systems. Also, robustness is very critical. This is something that academics sometimes don't think about because of the fact that we can demonstrate something once, they say, oh, it works. But obviously, to deploy it in a real system, we have to think a lot about the robustness of the materials, the recyclability of these materials, especially with temperature gradients, um, and et cetera. And finally, we also want to push performance because I think as we have demonstrated some potential, as we get them to be more efficient, as the key metric often is efficiency per cost, right? So we have to really think about that. But certainly, I hope you remember from this uh, talk that I've given is that there are abundant opportunities. And there is this important role in kind of the uh, of a novel nanostructure materials to help us think about addressing these large scale challenges we face to mitigate climate change. So with that, um, I, I want to acknowledge my group. Um, this is my current group that's really done a lot of the work that I demonstrated um, that I just talked about today, uh, some of my collaborators, as well as funding sources. So thank you very much. Oh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Bob, is, should I just take them, or do you want to? Okay, uh, uh, to the right, <laughs> on the top. Oh, um, so when you see a problem, do you think about, like, when you have nanotechnology, do you think, like, using nanotechnology, like, oh, just because we have this technology, we can do this? Or do you see a problem and then see how you can use nanotechnology to solve that problem? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and so I think there are different perspectives from different people. Um, for me, I see it as I need to understand what the problem is. Right. So I'm usually driven by, so what is the challenge that we're facing? And then I explore, I'm not a material scientist uh, by any means, but what we do is we look around and say, oh, what are the material scientists, what have they done? Right? What are the innovations? And so we say, well, if we could utilize their materials, can we design a system now that can address this need? And so that's always been kind of the philosophy and the process of my group. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I should mention, just to qualify, we're not creating a product yet. I call them proof of concepts because they're not out there in the market. Usually product is considered something that's already kind of for sale um, and liable and all that stuff. Um, I would say that as the more people that you consult, the better. And there are many ways to do that. First of all, I have wonderful students. Um, they teach me stuff every day. Um, and so we always discuss this together as a team. So usually there's a group of us, maybe a handful, um, that really initially discusses the concepts and comes up with the ideas. Then we also have group meetings within our group. But also an opportunity is always conferences and things like that nature where it's not maybe as active discussions, but when you present your work, um, you always get feedback. And a lot of that helps you kind of iterate in that process. So probably when you think about kind of how things evolve, probably you end up having at least tens of people, right, that have seen your work, right? But a lot of the initial concepts are, are kind of a few people. Go ahead. If atmospheric water harvesting were becoming on a larger scale, would it draw so much water from the atmosphere to affect weather patterns? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a question that we get asked a lot. And I think it's a question of what scale this kind of approach is applicable. Um, we don't see it as something that can address all of the water needs of everywhere in the world. Um, and um, we think that if you locally affect it slightly, it won't really affect total water patterns, but that uh, weather patterns. But we do are, are concerned about that, and we have to look into it further. Um, but we kind of see it as like a household kind of unit or like a village-like scale. But that's some, a very important question that we still have to address. On the top, over there. <clears throat> uh, do you have any concerns about the safety of thermal batteries, especially those nuclear power systems? Is there any fear of creating car fires? Yeah, it's a good question. So. Um, I'd like to think that I think, in fact, a lot of our materials are not really flammable. There's not really an issue with as much as safety compared to that of electrical battery because the concept is very different, right? So these materials are these kind of um, uh, uh, 
for example, metal organic frameworks. You know, there are these uh, materials that basically are pretty, um, uh, they're basically metal clusters with organic linkers. So there are these organic materials that really don't really affect, um, they shouldn't have much, they don't have reactivity, for example. And so um, in that way, then the other thing we're dealing with is water. Right, water's not really flammable, right, in that sense. So in fact, because of this mechanism and um, we're relying on the thermal processes in your vehicle itself already. And so because of that, we don't see this as a significant safety issue at all. Yes, over there to the left. Sure. Um, yeah, certainly plasmas are used a lot in a lot of physics types uh, uh, approaches, especially thinking about potentially fusion maybe or other um, ways of generating energy. Um, I can't speak to specifically as I don't work in that area, um, but I think that there's certainly, I think the, I think it's an open question in general still, right? Where are the, Where do we think and I think different communities will think different perspectives of where we can really, um, where's the, the best opportunity to create energy in the most efficient and low cost way, right? And I think the other thing will be what's the scale, right? And thinking about where are the needs for different regions of the world and um, trying to address that maybe in, um, specifically in targeting what are the needs for those areas. Yes, over there. Yeah, um, I have not worked specifically on um, transparent solar panels. I know people are working on them um, to help. I think there are opportunities there in thinking about maybe um, cogeneration. And the idea here is that if you can utilize some of the heat for something else, maybe there is an opportunity for, um, to facilitate a new system type design. Um, and so while there are people working in that area, I have not pursued that myself. Yes, go ahead. I think batteries certainly have made quite a bit of advancement, especially lithium ion, the past uh, few years even, right? But I think um, to really be aggressive and hit some of these targets that have been proposed, I think there, do, there, does, there has to be something else right now. I don't know, maybe a battery people would disagree with me, but I think there's, uh, at least what I've seen as kind of what's projected, I think it may be hard to kind of aim for these kind of targets, like you said, in the European Union. This is where we think the thermal battery could have a potential, but I think it really, um, I think it's non-traditional in the sense that I, um, in particular the automotive industry, when we've worked with them, they're very conservative for good reason. And so trying to think about new approaches, say even for HVAC, when they're so used to using a vapor compression cycle, um, there's a philosophical kind of uh, psychological kind of change and shift that needs to happen. Um, our hope is that as we get further and further developed in this technology, working with car manufacturers such as that of Ford, that there can be, once someone's willing to buy in, that potentially it can enable kind of, uh, kind of thinking about kind of more deployment of electric vehicles and trying to hit some of these targets that are set pretty aggressively by um, different places. Yes, go ahead. Can you repeat that? Certainly. Um, I think there's certainly, in terms of airplanes, there's a lot of aspects of the airplane. So the question is, where do you start, right? I think a lot of this is, so for example, people have been creating composite 
uh, materials for airplane wings, for example, to make them much uh, lighter, right? Um, and so there are lots of opportunities in airplanes themselves from the body of the airplane, the heating cooling of the airplane, to the engine designs. There's a lot, right, that is there. And I think it's ripe for many opportunities. In all these applications, we could certainly try to implement new nanostructured materials and how that advances kind of the design of these systems. However, so much of these materials are exploratory. So like I said, the key is, well, how do we get it, the path, so that they become reliable and it's not just a one-off experiment in the lab or a 10-off experiment, right? And so those are the questions that we need to pursue. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a good question. So I guess I didn't mention this, um, my collaborators, um, explicitly. So for example, Marin Solacek, um, who's worked a lot with photonic crystals, he's in physics here at MIT. Omar Yagi is in the Department of Chemistry. So um, I think we often say we have a problem. Um, what's, what are the innovations? We read papers. Um, and then we say, hey, this guy's a big shot in the field. Let's go try to talk to them, right? And it doesn't matter. I think at this stage, I think where we are in academia, we cross boundaries all the time. So, um, and in fact, in our department, we have material scientists in our department, even though they're in mechanical engineering. So you can see that departments don't matter. You see that, in fact, a lot of the impact that we're all trying to make relies on the interdisciplinary collaboration of many disciplines. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm not too familiar with Ventablack. What is that? Okay. Um, okay, so I see. Um, so um, certainly you want to maximize, so in a solar thermal application, you want to maximize the amount of, of thermal energy uh, you could capture. So um, right now you can see that when we carbon nanotubes, you get pretty much almost 99% essentially absorption. Right, so certainly we can look at other materials and maybe it could be lower cost in some ways as well. For panels themselves, you don't necessarily want to just absorb all of that because then it'll heat up, right? So you don't want to heat a solar panel typically because then the efficiency goes down uh, about a 0.5% or something like that per, uh, per degree, right? So um, in a typical PV cell, you probably don't want to use uh, those kinds of materials. Yes, go ahead. How much do uh, the, car the carbon nanotube structure that you mentioned cost of per unit? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I could say that they're pretty scalable now because of what they're often done is grown in a chemical vapor deposition kind of setup and can grow tons uh, per, uh, you can really grow a lot of it. Uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head. I would say that I didn't get into the details. Um, so this is really try to help us get a proof of concept. And I think there are other opportunities other than carbon nanotubes. The reason we chose carbon nanotubes is because we patterned it in a specific way. As I mentioned, I didn't get into the details, but we were trying to get a, getting higher and higher area ratios between the uh, emitter to absorber. And the idea here is you want to maximize the amount you can capture, but we pattern the local area because also because it's very good absorber, it's also a very good black body emitter. So you actually lose a lot of the heat, and we're relying on an area ratio to minimize that heat loss because the rest of the surface actually has a low emissivity. So it's kind of this trade-off we've been playing with, and so we work with that platform, but maybe in the future, it's not necessarily what we will use. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. In fact, I think the early conceptions of STPV, that's a good question, um, were thinking about space applications, for sure. Go ahead. So, um, some of the places that struggle with water, could be like big cities, and some problems of those places are like pollution or maybe radioactivity in the air. So, how would the process of obtaining water out of the earth be affected? 
Can you repeat that first part? I missed a little bit of your first part of the question. I was like in Congress about how some of the places that have these problems struggling with water uh, are like very populated places like big cities, but their air problems, pollution problems, how would the process of clean water be affected? Got it, got it, pollution, that's a, so in fact, this is a vapor transport problem, right? So the way we've captured the water, in fact, relies on vapor, and vapor doesn't usually capture, also takes contaminants with you. So in fact, there's a, because of the phase change itself, it's kind of readily kind of um, filtering the extra contaminants in the, um, in the air. I would say that's something that still we want to show, but we, uh, that's kind of the idea is that we think that it should actually be pretty pure water. In big cities, though, I think there's a lot, like I said, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all technology for these water challenges or energy challenges. I think it's going to be dependent on location sometimes. In certain big cities, they may have the infrastructure to, say, use other types of approaches for larger scale of water production, such as that of reverse osmosis or something like that as well. Sure, one more question. These Last are question. Questions. Go ahead. Are you worried about facing opposition to your technology by groups and lobbies that still want to make money off of fossil fuels and consumption? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, and as I've become more um, into the academic world where you you're, you start off as an idealist and thinking, oh, everything we develop, oh, of course, people will just buy in. But it's actually probably the opposite, right, of what happens. And so it's a good question because I think I've started realizing the importance of trying to educate more broadly kind of what we can offer, right, in terms of what technologies have. And, and of course, there will always be lobbyists and others that are in opposition. It's figuring out how to navigate that. So becoming kind of engaged in the policy discussions and things that are outside of engineering become really important in thinking about deploying technologies. And so, um, actually, as I, um, I think, I think it's all of, it's it's a role for all of us to be a part of. And I realized for myself, I need to be more engaged in those discussions and go to D.C. and talk to these people. And hopefully, as you educate people more, that they can also see your side. While they may not agree with you always, hopefully you can penetrate a few people, right, and maybe make things happen because that certainly is an important challenge. Um, we have a lot of kind of advanced technologies out there, and I think the reason they are not deployed is are because of the reasons you just mentioned. And so it is an educational opportunity for all of us, and also a challenge that we all have to face and figure out how do we over overcome these kind of hurdles. But I'm convinced that um, as a technologist, that if we can learn how to also speak their language, there's significant opportunities to maybe help contribute towards that and uh, make impact.